Section two of the Age of Elizabeth by Mandel Creighton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book one Religious Settlement in Germany and England. Chapter one Religious Settlement in Germany. Germany consisted of a number of small states, each under the rule of their hereditary prince, and of a number of free cities who were under no control except that of the emperor which was very slight. The German king, when he received coronation from the Pope, became emperor, and was looked upon as the head of Christendom. Under his presidency, the princes of the empire and representatives of the cities met together at a diet to settle matters of common interest for Germany. When many of the states and cities of Germany followed Luther's teaching and shook off the old ecclesiastical system, they were, of course, opposed by those that remained Catholic. To protect themselves, they formed in 1529 a league known as the League of Schmalkalt, from the place where it was concluded. The Catholics formed a league against them, and so Germany was divided into two opposite camps. Charles V had been emperor since 1519, and he would have interfered to put down Protestantism in Germany at its first growth if he had been able. He was, however, ruler of so many other countries besides Germany that he could not attend to Germany alone. As king of Spain, he had to war against the Moorish corsairs who injured the Spanish trade. As the inheritor of the possessions of the Dukes of Burgundy, he had to war with the King of France. As emperor, he had to make good his position in Italy. As head of the House of Austria, as well as head of Christendom, he had to drive out the Ottoman Turks who pressed up the Danube Valley and threatened to extend their conquests over Europe. All these things employed Charles V, and he needed all the help that he could get from Germany to enable him to carry out these great undertakings. In Germany he was king, but he was checked by the independent power of the princes and the free cities, and could raise money and troops only for such purposes as they approved of. Many of them were in favor of the Reformation and would not help him in any undertaking directed against Protestantism. He thought it wise, therefore, to leave Protestantism alone at first, and to draw from the gratitude of the Protestant princes the help that he needed for his other political designs. He opposed Protestantism, for he was emperor and head of the Catholic world, but he was not, therefore, a devoted adherent of the papacy, and was convinced that some religious changes were necessary. These changes he hoped to be able to introduce when he had leisure. Meanwhile, he let matters take their course in Germany so far as not to interfere forcibly. At last, in 1544, Charles V had put down the pirates, had succeeded in making himself master of the greater part of Italy, had seen the Ottomans fall back from their most threatening position, and had made peace with France. Now he could turn his attention to Germany. His plan was to compel the Pope to summon a general council at which the points in dispute between Catholics and Protestants should be settled but the Protestants refused to acknowledge such a council, and Charles, with the help of the Pope, declared war against the Schmalkaldic League in 1546. Many Protestants helped him, for not all of them belonged to the League, and some hoped to get toleration without resistance to the authority of the state. The chief leaders of the Schmalkaldic army were John Frederick, Elector of Saxony, and Philip, Landgrave of Hesse. Their army was stronger than the emperor's, but was broken up by the retreat of the elector. His electorate had been attacked in his absence by his nephew Maurice, who, though a Protestant, was fighting on the emperor's side. When once the Schmalkotic forces were broken, the emperor reduced the Protestant cities one by one. Next year he defeated the elector and took him prisoner. The landgrave of Hesse submitted to him, and was also kept in prison. It seemed as though Protestantism was entirely ruined. But meanwhile the Pope had become alarmed at this success. 
he had also quarrelled with the emperor about the possession of some towns in italy he was afraid that charles v might settle religious matters in a way unfavourable to the papacy so he broke up the council which had begun to sit at trent as he thought that place was too much under the emperor's power thus charles v had compelled the protestants to obey the council but there was no council to obey hereupon he took a step like henry the eighth and published a decree called the interim fifteen forty eight which enacted the old ecclesiastical system with a few changes and toleration on a few points this was to be the religion of germany till the council could go on the interim however was liked by neither party to the protestants it was as bad as romanism to the catholics it seemed to be an arbitrary interference in religious matters moreover the national feeling of the germans was hurt by the way in which the emperor enforced obedience to it and kept a foreign army in germany the german princes also were aggrieved by the imprisonment of the elector and the landgrave it was an infringement of the rights of the princes as a class which no prince could see with satisfaction maurice had been made elector of saxony by the emperor for his services he was a protestant but the emperor wished to show that he punished not opinions but disobedience perhaps maurice had hoped for greater toleration for protestantism and was now disappointed perhaps his policy was entirely selfish and he only helped the emperor that he might get the electorate of saxony for himself now that he had got it he saw he could only keep it by helping protestantism against the emperor it is hard to say which of these views is true maurice is one of the most puzzling characters in history he was a master of deceit and he died in fifteen fifty three before he had time to go far enough with his plans to enable us to judge what he really meant at all events maurice of saxony laid a deep plan against the emperor seeing that the german protestants were not strong enough to fight for themselves he entered into alliance with henry the second of france henry the second had only lately come to the throne and was willing enough to signalize his reign by striking a blow at the great enemy of france maurice laying his plans with deep secrecy managed to keep together the army with which he had been besieging the protestant town of magdeburg in the emperor's name as he found that two of his secretaries were spies of the emperor's he kept them in his service and wrote false letters whose contents were meant to deceive the emperor then when all was ready and the emperor entirely unprepared was at innsbruck where he had gone to look after the reassembling of the council of trent maurice took the field against him charles v had to flee from innsbruck in the middle of the night and only left at two hours before maurice entered the french meanwhile had entered lorraine and taken metz toul and verdun charles v's prestige was broken he had no money and no troops he must make peace in germany unless he was prepared to see germany permanently divided if he hesitated the result would be that the catholic states would go with austria and the protestant states would form a new power under the protection of france so sorely against his will charles v had to agree to a peace at a meeting at passau in 1552 maurice demanded toleration for the protestants toleration granted to them for themselves without any condition of a future council or any mention of papal permission the emperor could not be prevailed upon to grant this it seemed to him to be a neglect of his duty as head of christendom he would only grant toleration until a diet had been held to settle uniformity really charles v's plans had failed he was a firm believer in the old political system which depended on outward unity he had hoped to unite his vast dominions into one great power for this purpose he was prepared to make a few changes in the old political and ecclesiastical system though he was not prepared to move from the main ideas on which they were founded spain italy sicily and the netherlands he knew how to manage 
he won over says a venetian ambassador the spaniards by his gravity and wisdom the italians by his success the flemings by his geniality and kindliness but the germans in spite of his efforts he never understood so when he had succeeded everywhere else he failed in germany the german princes protestant and catholic alike looked with entire disfavour on his attempt to make a strong central power in germany the german people protestant and catholic alike failed to understand his moderate position in ecclesiastical matters they wanted either no change at all or much more sweeping changes than he was prepared for so the opposition to him had grown strong just as his plans had seemed on the point of success when that opposition had openly declared itself he had to choose between the surrender of his plans and a new hazardous war by which he would run great risk of losing the netherlands and protestant germany together charles v gave way for the present the future still depended on his success against france he laid siege to Metz with a large army but it was to no purpose his troops began to die as winter came on and charles was obliged to raise the siege saying with a sigh that fortune was a woman and did not favour the old after this failure there was no course left but concession the diet of augsburg in fifteen fifty five confirmed the peace agreed to at passau the protestants were to practise their own religion wherever it had been at that time established henceforth all princes and cities might tolerate or prohibit either religion within their territories the maxim cuius regio eius religio he who rules the country may settle its religion was now distinctly accepted by this decree of the diet of augsburg the protestants obtained for the first time a legal position within the empire their right to maintain their religion was unconditionally recognized henceforth catholicism could not claim to be the established religion of germany no emperor could lawfully attack protestant princes on the ground of their protestantism only the new religion had obtained legal recognition but still there were many points left unsettled and there were many points which were not likely to be settled peaceably at once one question especially about which there was no agreement was of pressing importance what was to become of the ecclesiastical property of bishops or other ecclesiastics who joined the reformed communion was church land to become secularized when its ecclesiastical holder became a protestant married and had children were the lands given in past time to the old church to pass over to this new sect on the other hand was it fair to the protestants that all the vast districts at present under the rule of ecclesiastics should always belong to the catholic powers and always be exempt from protestant influence no agreement could be come to on this point by the diet but it was settled by a decree of the emperor that any prelate who joined the reform body should forthwith vacate his ecclesiastical office with all its possessions and a new election should at once be made to his office this which was called the ecclesiastical reservation was merely a decree of the emperor and was not accepted by the protestants as a definite law for the present both parties were content to let matters rest peace had been patched up for a time but no one expected it to last the reformation struggle paused in germany for the rest of the century only to break out with greater violence in the terrible thirty years war meanwhile however it remained to be seen if charles v would agree to this new state of things it was entirely opposed to his views of the unity of his dominions and he would not have accepted it if it had been possible for him to stand out against it but he saw that the protestants in germany aided by france were too strong for him unless he could get a powerful ally he turned his attention for this end to england the future depended on the success of the connection now established between england and the austro-spanish power 
End of section two.